Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I am Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and through it we are seeking to be drawn closer to our God as we get into His Word. His Word is a word direct, directed toward us. It is a word that is living. It is a word that can get into our, our whole beings and transform us. And let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is indeed a wonderful day that you have made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. Heavenly Father, we ask now that as we have gathered around your word, that in fact, uh, through your word, we would be drawn closer to you. We would be uh, drawn more into that personal relationship that you want to have with all people on earth. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, now to uh, help us in that. We ask Holy Spirit to come and teach us. We ask you to loose my tongue that I might, in, in fact, declare your word clearly. And we pray that our ears would be anointed to receive what is spoken here. And, and so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday we heard the great lengths God was willing to go to to get people to, to turn to him. God in no way wants to destroy anyone. God wants to bind up and he wants to heal. In all honesty, the severe words the Lord gave to King Ahaz through Isaiah and the severe word he gives to others is given in the hope that people will take a look at their lives and their situation and make a choice for God. God doesn't hide what will happen if people persist in going their own way. No, in fact, he's quite upfront about it. He's upfront about the consequences so that hopefully people will choose to turn away from whatever they are doing, which is not in keeping with the Lord's will and go with God. The unfortunate truth is this. It usually takes severe and terrible circumstances coming our way before we seek the Lord. Having already spoken about how God does not want to bring judgment upon people, but that he desires that people turn from their wickedness and live, let's consider the assignment the Lord gave to his prophet Jonah. The prophetic book of Jonah is only four chapters in length, but we see firsthand God's heart toward the people of Assyria. As we know from what we have read so far, Assyria was not exactly on good terms with God's people. In fact, yesterday we heard that Assyria was going to be picked by God or had been picked by God to be the rod of his anger toward Judah and Jerusalem. Nevertheless, some years before Ahaz became king of Judah, the Lord came to Jonah and told him to go to the great city of Nineveh, and that was Assyria's capital city, and preach against it. The reason for the assignment God was giving to Jonah was this because its wickedness had come up before the Lord. Jonah, however, had zero interest, zero desire to go to Nineveh and preach against it. He wanted the Lord to destroy the city and its people. So Jonah got on the first ship he could find, which would take him in the opposite direction of Nineveh. We are told in Jonah 1 verse 3 that Jonah was fleeing from the Lord. He was running from the assignment. Now, how many of us realize that we actually cannot flee from the Lord? Where in the world could we possibly go where God is not already present? Nowhere. King David pondered this question. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? He answered these two questions in this way. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. 
If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So try as he did, Jonah could not flee from the Lord, and eventually he did go to Nineveh to preach against it. It took Jonah three days to walk through the entire city, preaching against it as he went. He proclaimed 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. Much to Jonah's dismay, the Ninevites listened to the word he was preaching. Their response was this. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. We read that when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The Ninevites did what God was hoping they would do and what God was always hoping that his chosen people would do. The Ninevites repented. They turned from their evil ways. Another interesting point to make in this passage from the book of Jonah is this. We have no word recorded for us in the Bible which would have given the Ninevites any hope whatsoever that the Lord would possibly change his mind. The only word we hear is a word of destruction. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. It does not appear that Jonah gave them any hope of survival or any hope of surviving the overthrow that was announced to them. However, in spite of the fact that they had no word of hope declared to them, they chose repentance and prayer anyway in the hope that God might possibly change his mind. And he did. Come to find out, this is why Jonah didn't want to go and preach to the Ninevites in the first place. Jonah knew that the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love. He knew that there was a very good possibility that the Lord would change his mind and not bring destruction upon the Ninevites if they repented. And he didn't want them to be given that chance. God's attitude toward the people and animals of Nineveh is recorded for us in the final two verses of the book of Jonah. Jonah is upset not only with God, but with a vine that had given him shade. And the Lord to Jonah says, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? What the Ninevites did was what the Lord was hoping his own chosen people would do. But time and time again, though the Lord sent many prophets to them to declare his word to them, God's own people chose to rebel rather than repent. And because his own people chose rebellion, God had to bring about the judgment he had told them would come to them. So getting now back to the book of the prophet Isaiah, I've already mentioned that, the, that Isaiah declared that Assyria was going to be used by the Lord to be the rod of his anger against his own people. Even though these people were going to be the rod of God's anger, they were not supposed to be going beyond the measure of judgment the Lord gave them. In this, the king of Assyria made a huge mistake. Not only was he planning to destroy, to put an end to many nations, he was taking credit for the victories. That was something he should not have done. It was the Lord who had given him victory. The honor for the victories needed to have been given to the Lord, and because the king of Assyria did not do this, the Lord in turn was going to punish him for his willful pride and the haughty look in his eyes. After all, the axe does not raise itself above him who swings it, and the saw does not boast against the one who uses it. The good news in all of this is this. 
there would, in fact, be some, a remnant of God's people who would get it. A remnant would return to the Lord. A remnant would come to truly rely on the Lord. Obviously, the Lord desires that everyone get it, but everyone will not. But thankfully, there will be some. Yesterday I read the beginning verses of Isaiah 11 and the beginning verses of Isaiah 61, more or less side by side. The shoot which would come from the stump of Jesse, this branch would bear fruit. We learned yesterday how the sevenfold spirit of the Lord would rest on him and how it was through the anointing of the Holy Spirit that Jesus did the work the Father gave him to do. Being endowed with the sevenfold spirit of the Lord the one who would come from the stump of Jesse would not, and he will not, judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Let's remember that we, too, are empowered by the spirit of the living God. Let's draw on the endless store of wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, and knowledge the Holy Spirit makes available to us but always delighting in the fear of the Lord. Fear here meaning our having a reverential awe of the Lord. Yesterday we heard Isaiah speak of a time that, as yet, does not exist, but will exist in the future. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will leave them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of a cobra, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Oh, won't this be a glorious time. What Isaiah describes here will not be accomplished by any man or any nation, it will only be accomplished by God. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. Let's be sure to notice in this verse that the root of Jesse means Jesus Christ will stand as a banner for the peoples and nations, um, and the peoples and the nations, they will rally to him as Jesus stands as that banner. Jesus did not come as Messiah for Jews alone, but as Messiah for all people and all nations throughout the world. Jesus spoke of his death in this way, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Jesus is the banner the Lord raised up. Jesus is the one the nations and all peoples will come. They will come to him. He is the Prince of Peace, and through faith in him we enter into God's rest. In Isaiah 12, we hear how God's people will respond to all that God will do for them. They will respond with praises to the Lord. In that day, you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With you... With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. As I read these words for myself, I was reminded of a song. I was reminded of a canticle I used to sing often in worship. I'm going to play a rendition of it for you so that you can hear some of the words of the joy which would be expressed by God's people. The words of this canticle are taken from actual biblical passages. Listen, you nations of the world, listen to the word of the Lord. Announce it from coast to coast, declare it to distant islands. The Lord who scattered Israel will gather his people again. 
and he will keep watch over them as a shepherd watches his flock. Listen, you nations of the world, listen to the word of the Lord. Announce it from coast to coast, declare it to distant islands. With shouts of joy they will come, their faces radiantly happy. For the Lord is so generous to them, he showers his people with gifts. Listen, you nations of the world, listen to the word of the Lord. Announce it from coast to coast, declare it to distant islands. Young women will dance for joy, and men young and old will make merry. Like a garden refreshed by the rain, they will never be in want again. Break into shouts of great joy, Jacob is free again. Teach nations to sing the song, the Lord has saved his people. When the Lord acts, it's time to sing, and it's time to shout, it's time to dance for joy, and it's time to make merry. We now come to Isaiah 13, and the Lord, through Isaiah, turns his attention to Babylon. And the prophetic word he gives is not pretty. It's a prophetic word specifically about Babylon, which will eventually be the nation who will take Judah into captivity. But it is also a word to the world, reminding all people of God's attitude towards sin and arrogance and pride. Let's listen to what the Lord says through Isaiah. An oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop. Shout to them, beckon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. Listen, a noise on the mountains like that of a great multitude. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens. The Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Like a hunted gazelle, like a sheep without a shepherd, each will return to his own people, each will flee to his native land. Whoever is captured will be thrust through, all who are caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses will be looted and their wives ravished. Now having read through these 16 verses, we now learn who the instrument of God's wrath against Babylon will be. And it will be the Medes, M-E-D-E-S. In the book of Daniel, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream which he did not understand, but which disturbed him greatly. He would, he would have had all of his astrologers and sorcerers and enchanters and magicians executed had the Lord not revealed to Daniel both the dream and its interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar's dream 
was about the future. It was a dream about a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. When Nebuchadnezzar was watching, a, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became chaff, like chaff, on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, this was the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Now, Daniel is about to interpret that dream for him. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar is the king in Babylon. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. He has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet, it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with clay, baked clay, so that the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of all these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God, said Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. The nation which Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream which would follow the kingdom of Babylon would be the Medes, or more specifically the Medes and the Persians, Persian peoples. The overthrow of Babylon is so complete that in these verses that we are now going to read, Babylon's overthrow is compared to the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. Hear what Isaiah continues on saying. The Lord says, See, I stir up against them the Medes, who do not care for silver and have no delight in gold. Their bows will strike down the young men. They will have no mercy on infants, nor will they look with compassion on children. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses. There the owls will dwell, and there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in her strongholds. Jackals in her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand, and her, her days will not be prolonged. The Lord, through the Apostle John, continues to declare the ruin of Babylon. Only John's perspective is the latter days of the earth before the return of Christ. Let's hear what John says about Babylon. This is in Revelation 18. After this, I, meaning John, saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. 
for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she is given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen. I am not a widow and I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire for it is the Lord Almighty who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Whoa, whoa, O great city, O Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth. Every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and bodies and souls of men. Woe to you, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet and glittered with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Jumping down to verse 21, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and all who have been killed on the earth. I read through these texts from Isaiah and Daniel and Revelation, and my appreciation of the Lord grows. For the Lord has the entire world within his authority and control. Nothing escapes him. Praise the Lord. And let me now bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we will see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which He reveals Himself and His will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and He can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.